Now for our keynote, it's my pleasure to introduce Lord Matt Ridley. Um, he is the author of The Rational Optimist, of which each of you have a copy uh, in your bags. And so uh, we're really pleased to have him here. Uh, he's um, given a number of um, talks in, in different locations around the world. Uh, one of his uh, that he did for TED, for TED Talks, has millions of views. I believe the title of that talk was When Ideas Have Sex. Uh, he had me at Ideas. Um, and without further ado, please join me in welcoming Lord Matt Ridley. All right, you got your own mic. Let me get your slides here, sir. Thank you very much indeed. It's wonderful to be here. And um, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm the only guy wearing a tie in the room, I guess. I'm sorry about that. But it's got the, the microphone's attached to it, so I can't take it off. Um, and uh, I'm not here to tell you about online advertising. I'm not here to tell you about the internet. You know far more about that than I do. But I am here to try and put everything in a bit of perspective to talk about where innovation comes from and where it's going and how much further it can go because I think we need to go back a million years, literally, to understand where it comes from. Um, this is an object that sits on my desk at home. It's a, an Ashwellian hand axe of the kind that uh, Homo erectus used. It's probably half a million years old. Uh, my wife got it for me on eBay. And <laughs> next to it sits an object of exactly the same size and shape. <coughs> which is bizarre. I just noticed this one day. These two objects are exactly the same size. And in that story, from that object on the left to the object on the right, is the whole of human history. And the really interesting thing is that innovation comes quite late in the story. Because the Ashwellian hand axe was made to that pretty well that exact design between a million and a half and half a million years ago. There was no innovation in the world of Homo erectus. They had technology, and it's a beautiful technology, if you want to cut up a woolly rhinoceros. They had technology, but they didn't have innovation. You could, live your, you could not just live your whole lifetime, you could live thousands of generations without seeing innovation. And even a thousand years ago, we, you could live your whole lifestyle without seeing a new farm implement come along in, in your village or whatever. So that's kind of what I want to talk about. But before I do that, I just want to cheer you up because Woody Allen once said that mankind stands at a crossroads. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness, the other to total extinction. Let's pray we have the wisdom to choose the right path. And that is all too often how we hear about the future. Everybody says there's going to be a disaster of one kind or another, whereas actually things keep getting better. And I just want to remind you how much better they've got thanks to innovation. This is world GDP in real terms, corrected for inflation. The Great Recession that we've just been through is on that chart. It's the little blip towards the end. But globally, if you take the whole world and you correct for inflation, the, the value of the goods and services we are creating is accelerating upwards and has been for 60 years. Correct for population, i.e. do it per capita, and it's still a pretty impressive grasp, particularly if you throw it back 400 years and two economists have tried to do so. You wouldn't, wouldn't rely on their data too much, but that's their guess as to what's happened to world GDP per capita over the past 400 years. And let's just look where it's headed. If it does continue like this towards for the rest of this century, if that were to happen, the average income of the average person on the planet would be two to four times as high as the average American's income is today, in real terms. It's an amazing opportunity, if it's, if it's possible, if it's true, and if we can do it without destroying the planet. I'll come to that at the end. <laughs> it's not just that the rich are getting richer. The poor are getting less poor. Number of people living on $1.25 a day is heading for zero by the year 2028. Now, that's an awfully low level. There's an awful lot of poverty above that level, uh, and it may not happen for whatever reason. And it's not just because we're making Chinese people richer. If you exclude China, you can see that the, the number is still going down. And it's not really money that measures the improvement of our lives, is it? You know, money's part of it, but it's, it, it's time. The crucial metric is time. How long do you take to fulfill a need, and therefore how many needs do you, do you manage to fulfill? And I'll give you an example here. How long does it take you to earn enough money to turn on a lamp for an hour to read a book? Preferably mine. Um, and the answer is, if you're on the average wage today, and you want to turn on an 18 watt compact fluorescent bulb for an hour, which would give you about 1200 lumen hours of light, then you would need 
uh, to work for about half a second on the average US wage. That was 15 years ago. It's probably a bit less than that now. Your grandparents had to work for eight seconds with an older technology, the incandescent bulb instead of the compact fluorescent bulb, uh, and with lower average wages, um, uh, and with different prices of electricity and so on. So that's seven and a half seconds that you've got that your grandparents didn't have, which you can spend fulfilling a different need, which gives someone else a different job, which is economic growth. That's where it comes from. That's the whole point. By shrinking the, the amount of time it takes to fulfill a need, we can fulfill more needs and give more people employment in providing them. But if you go back to 1880, it took 15 minutes of work to earn an hour of, la of light. It's quite a big investment of time. And in 1800, six hours. You'd have had to work for six hours on the average US wage in 1800 to earn enough money to buy a tallow candle. So when you see all those TV adaptations of Jane Austen, you know, and they're all dancing under chandeliers with hundreds of candles in them, I don't think most people could afford to be at that party. <laughs> so we're better off. But are we healthier, happier, safer, better fed, cleverer, kinder, cleaner, freer, more peaceful and more equal? I mean, quite a lot of people keep telling us we're not all of those things. You often hear in the news how these things are getting worse. But they're not. They're all getting better. Let me give you some examples. Healthier. Diseases are in retreat all over the world. Child mortality is the biggest measure of misery I can think of. In other words, having to bury a child that can't be anything worse in the world, I suspect. Uh, and look at the way it's been coming down globally, but on every continent. Africa lagging behind for a long time. But since this chart ends, there's another nine years, and Africa has started to fall much faster. 5% a year declines in childhood, child mortality in Africa. Happier. There is, surprisingly, we, for a long time we thought there wasn't a correlation between wealth and happiness, but better data now shows that there is. The richer you are, the happier you are, on the whole, on average, um, both within countries and between countries, both within lifetimes. And of course, it's not a linear relationship and it's not perfect and it seems to level off a bit and it's possible to be very rich and very unhappy, but that's all right because it cheers everybody else up. <laughs> We're safer. We hear a lot about extreme weather, about droughts and floods and storms and how they're uh, reducing, uh, uh, how they're threatening more and more people, but actually look up the numbers. How many people are dying as a result of droughts, floods and storms, extreme weather? Uh, and the answer is the number of people dying is down by 93% since the 1920s and the probability of dying from those causes is down by 98%. Now that's not because weather's got less dangerous. It's because we have better houses and better communication and better transport and better um, uh, infrastructure of various kinds. We're better fed. Despite doubling the population in the last 50, 60 years, uh, we have uh, increased the amount of food available per head on every continent, including Africa. We're cleverer. Isn't that great? Um, it's not just that we're better educated. In fact, this thing called the Flynn effect, which is the rising of IQ scores in all countries that's going on, is more apparent in the, in the versions of the IQ test that have least to do with education. So it's probably some aspect of a much richer environment that we grow up in with more uh, stimulating uh, um, uh, things around us as we, as we grow. The air is cleaner, not today, of course. We've got a little pollution in London today. It's come from the Sahara or something. Uh, and of course, there are places where the air is not getting cleaner, like Beijing. Um, but on the whole, compared with what, you know, what the 1970s was like in London, let alone the 1950s, the air is much, much cleaner. This is US general averaged air pollution, uh, same for water. So our lives are generally much cleaner. Uh, we're kinder. We're giving more to charity as a proportion of our income. This is UK data, but you can find this around the world as well. We're freer. More of us live in countries that are democratic and fewer in autocracies. The number of autocrats in the world can now fit in quite a small restaurant if they want to have a meeting. <laughs> we're more peaceful. Homicides on the decline. All sorts of violence, torture, genocide, all sorts of things are showing decline, as, as Stephen Pinker showed in his extraordinary book, The Better Angels of Our Nature. And this is the data on warfare. The number of people killed in warfare in the, decade, in the last decade was the lowest in recorded history. Now, it may not have felt like that here because of Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, but globally that was true. Now, it'll probably tick up again. I'm not saying the warfare's finished. Obviously not. There's a lot going on at the moment. But 
we forget just how violent the past was. The one that surprises people most is equality. The world is more equal in terms of income uh, than probably it's ever been. And the reason for that is because, well certainly since the Industrial Revolution, and the reason for that is because the rich are getting rich, sorry, the poor are getting rich faster than the rich are getting rich at the moment. Poor countries are getting rich much faster than rich countries are getting rich. People in poor countries are gaining income, particularly <coughs> since the recession. The recession has been a great equaliser. And as Hans Rosling likes to put it, the number of, uh, in, the, in, 90, in the early 1970s, there really were two worlds. There was a rich world and a poor world. Uh, and now there's a huge middle. Uh, so on the whole, we're converging towards, towards the middle there. So that's what innovation has done for us. Like, what's the Romans done for us? What's innovation done for us? It's made those extraordinary changes in living standards. But how is this possible? Why, where does it come from? Why does it happen to us and not to rabbits or rocks? Uh, go back to this image again and ask yourself what these objects are made of. The stone object is obviously made of stone, a single substance, and it, and it embodies a single idea, the idea of using a sharp edge to cut things up. The, the object on the right is made from different substances, plastic, metal, silicon, and it embodies different ideas. The idea of computing, the idea of the mouse, the idea of semiconductors. And these ideas occur to different people at different times and different places, and they came together in this object. People who are long dead, people who live thousands of miles apart, their ideas combine into these technologies that we use. And I think that's a crucial insight into how we innovate and what innovation is. It's basically the combination and recombination of technologies. My favourite example is a thing called the pill camera. You take, you swallow it, it takes a picture of your insides on the way through. It came about after a conversation between a gastroenterologist and a guided missile designer. <laughs> so the secret, the thing that makes us unique, doesn't happen in other animals, is the fact that we have this obsession with exchanging. We love swapping things. I'll give you this if you give me that. It's a huge habit of human beings. It goes back a long way. In fact, Adam Smith famously observed that no man ever saw a dog make fair and deliberate exchange of a bone with another dog. It's, 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 it's a human thing, this, and it's what leads to rising living standards. Why? Well, let me give you a very, very simple example derived from something called the law of comparative advantage, which is a, an idea that's been described as the only proposition in the whole of social science that is both true and surprising. It's a bit unfair, that, but anyway. David Ricardo was a London stockbroker in 1817 who realised that trade benefited two countries, but trade between countries would, would benefit those countries even if one of them was better at making everything than the other. Because so long as one of them was slightly better at some things than other things, then there would be an advantage for them trading. It's a very counterintuitive idea, actually. It's a much harder idea to grasp than people think. But let me explain it in Stone Age terms, because I think that makes it more interesting. We've got two blokes called Adam and Oz. They're sitting around a campfire. They both need an axe and a spear to go out hunting. Uh, and uh, Adam takes four hours to make a spear and three hours to make an axe, so Adam's hopeless. Oz takes only two hours to make a, a, an axe and one hour to make a spear. So Oz is better than Adam at both spears and axes. So Oz doesn't need Adam. Adam is a waste of space. Oz should just make his spear and his axe and go out hunting, right? No, because if Oz made two spears and Adam made two axes and they swapped, then they would each have what they want, but they would each have saved an hour of work. That's only true because uh, uh, Adam is better at making axes and Oz is better at making spears, but then if they start specialising, that's going to become true. The more they specialise, the more value there is in exchange. The more they exchange, the more value there is in specialisation. This is a kind of fast breeder reactor. It's going to build on itself in this interesting way. And that, I think, is actually the whole story of human history, that the, the, the increase of this phenomenon where we get other people to do things for us and we do things for other people, we get more and more specialised as producers, and more and more diversified as consumers. Um, and it can go backwards. That's often what happened. You know, when the fall of Rome uh, happened, Italy went back to not being uh, producing goods for trade. It produced goods for subsistence. So ask yourself about this, these objects again. Who made them? I mean, the, man on the, the, the object on the left was made by the man who used it, probably, as far as we know. 
The object on the right was not made by me, even though I used it. It was made for me by hundreds of people around the world, thousands, maybe even millions. There was a bloke in Brazil growing coffee whose coffee was going to be drunk by a man on an oil rig, whose oil was going to be used in a plastics factory, whose plastic was going to be used in the mouse factory. They were all working for me. They were my servants. They were part of a project called Make a Computer Mouse for Matt Ridley. They didn't know it, and I didn't know it, and I've never met most of them. But that's what it's like. That's why we have the lifestyle today that's like that of a king. Because we've got people to do things for us. I mean, Louis XIV, it's a fair bet he didn't have to make that outfit for himself. He had 498 people to prepare his dinner every night. But each of you has 498 people to prepare your dinner tonight. They're in cafes and bistros and restaurants within half an hour of here. There's at least 498 chefs who are just hoping one of you is going to come in and eat their food. And they're working for you just as if they were, they, were, they were your chefs. We're not the only animals that have a division of labour. This thing of, I'll do this for you if you do this for me, is, is the whole secret of the social insects. It's what makes them such a successful group of creatures. Uh, because they have these nests with a division of labour between queens and workers and soldiers and all this kind of thing. They work for each other as well in the same way. But there's one big difference, which is that they only do it within a family. An ant nest is just a great big family. Everybody's related. And the reason for that is because they, they have a reproductive division of labour. That is to say they delegate reproduction to the queen. It's the one thing we rather like to do for ourselves. We don't like delegating it. Um, <laughs> even in Britain, we don't expect the queen to do it for us. <laughs> And of course, agriculture, when you think about it, is just this writ large. It's, it's species working for each other. Here's a shepherd working for his sheep, who is, and the sheep are working for the dog, and the dog is working for both of them. They're all working for each other. That's what agriculture is. It's, it's the expression of the division of labour between species. When do we start doing this? When do we hit on this habit? Uh, don't worry, I'll get back to the internet and the future in a minute. I just want to go down the, into millions of years ago for a few minutes, because it's kind of interesting. When did, we, when did we begin trading? When did we exchange over long distances and so on? And the, the answer to that is that trade is at least 10 times as old as agriculture. It's probably about 100,000 years old. And the first evidence for it is when beads made from snail shells start turning up hundreds of miles inland in Algeria. And uh, the, the basically objects don't move that sort of distance um, by people walking all the way to the shore picking up uh, a, a shell and walking back again. They tend to move that long, those kind of distances by trade. Um, we know that because if you look at modern Aborigines in Australia, you get the same thing. Now this was something other hominid species never did. The Neanderthals only ever used local materials. In, in Georgia there are caves where you can find Neanderthal remains and the tools they used, and the tools are all made from local stuff. As soon as modern humans move in, they're using tools from a long way away. Uh, tools made of material from a long way away. And that means, of course, that they're not just getting stuff from long distances, they're getting ideas from long distances too. They're beginning to be able to draw upon invention wherever it happens. They're beginning to use the cloud. So let me now just go back to the question I originally asked, which is where does innovation come from? What is it and, and how does it happen? Um, and this is Moore's law. You know Moore's law, the increase in, in computing power for a certain amount of uh, expenditure um, uh, over time, the rough doubling every year and a half or whatever it is. Uh, but actually this is more than Moore's law. Moore's law is just the right-hand section of this chart. What Ray Kurzweil has done on this chart is he's pointed out that Moore's law goes back through preceding technologies. That, in fact, you can't even see the invention of the integrated circuit on this chart. It's just an extension of what happened before. There's an evolutionary, incremental, inexorable, inevitable aspect to this. And when Gordon Moore came up with Moore's Law, we ought to have said, right, OK, now we know that, we can cheat it. We can jump ahead. But we didn't. There's something extraordinarily sort of evolutionary about this. We need to invent each step in order to take the next step. There's something inexorable uh, about it. I mean, where's the Second World War on this chart? 
Where's the Great Depression? Where's the post-war boom? It seems to march at its own pace, innovation. It's evolutionary. And if you look at um, the history of any tool, you see pedigrees, you see family trees, you see descent with modification. Here's the, the story of the axe told in five different technologies. The middle one is the one that they found on Otzi, the man in, 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 the, uh, in the Alps who they found in the ice a few years ago. The other aspect of innovation that's very like evolution is the fact that it relies to an extraordinary extent on trial and error. We tend to think that in innovators are brilliant people who suddenly wake up in the middle of the night and say, right, I'm going to invent such and such. In fact, what they do is they try all sorts of ideas, most of which don't work. Uh, here's Art Fry, the, the inventor of the post-it note, uh, saying innovation is a numbers game. You have to go through 5,000 to 6,000 ideas to find one successful business. And if you look at any technology, here's early aeroplanes, you see that there's an awful lot of experimentation going on. I mean, look at the tailplanes on these aeroplanes. They're all completely different. These are early designs for aeroplanes. What we're doing is we're trying and selecting. We're, we're using natural selection, just like evolution does. We're throwing out mutations and seeing what works, and choosing some and rejecting others. We've got other aspects of innovation that look very like evolution. We get convergent evolution, as it's called. That is to say, identical solutions turning up in different times and different places to the same problem. Here's the boomerang invented in ancient Egypt and also in modern Australia. Agriculture is the great example of this, invented six or seven times separately around the world. And of course, once we get a, a good idea, <coughs> it has to go into competition with other ideas. Uh, and you get extinction if um, uh, it's um, a bad idea. And then once you've got a, the, the right idea, you replicate it. But there's one aspect of evolution that we can leave out of this story when we're talking about technology, and we shouldn't, and that is sex. Cumulative evolution doesn't work in the biological world without sex. Uh, because it, without sex, you can't accumulate different genetic innovations. Let me give you an example of why not. There's a species that's evolving along merrily and it comes up with two great mutations, one in one individual, one in another. You have to choose between them. You have to decide which of them is the better. Natural selection in this case decides that the green mutation is a good idea, the red mutation not so good. But if they're both good ideas, you might want them both. You can't do that in an asexual species where you get your genes straight from your mother and there's no father involved. In a sexual species, at some point an individual can inherit one of the mutations from its mother and the other from its father. So it can bring them together, it can combine them. And what's happening here is that the species is now drawing upon any mutation that occurs anywhere in the species. Just like we're drawing upon any invention that happens anywhere in the human race through exchange and innovation. So my argument is that exchange is playing the same role in technology that sex is playing in biology. Um, I mean, what happens if you cut people off from, from exchange networks, from trade, if you, if you isolate them and say, uh, you now are dependent on your own resources to invent things? And the answer is that not only does the innovation rate drop, it goes backwards. Tasmanian. Tasmania became an island 10,000 years ago because of rising sea levels. Before that, it was just a peninsula on the southern part of Australia. The 4,000 or so people who survived on Tasmania during the next 10,000 years not only didn't get hold of innovations that happened elsewhere in Australia, like the boomerang, because they were out of contact with Australia, but they actually gave up a number of the technologies they already had. They gave up bone tools altogether, for example. Uh, and the reason they did this was because their numbers were simply too small to keep up this exchange and specialization pattern that you need to keep technologies going. They had to become more generalist, and so they forgot how to do things. It's a strange idea, but it shows up all over the world. If you isolate people, they tend not only to stop inventing, they disinvent. Didn't happen on Tierra del Fuego, which is a similarly inhospitable island. But they got hold of things like bows and arrows. Why? Because there was trading contact across the Strait of Magellan throughout the 10,000 years, which is much narrower than the Bass Strait, which is much wider. And if you look at fishing tackle from the ancient Pacific, from uh, before Western contact, you find the islands with the most contact with other islands 
were the ones that had the most diverse and sophisticated fishing tackle. So human beings don't invent things as lonely individuals. They invent things by sharing ideas. They invent things <coughs> in the cloud, and the cloud is 100,000 years old. Here are six great inventors. Archimedes, al Khwarizmi, the inventor of algebra, uh, Fibonacci, George Stevenson, Thomas Edison, Steve Jobs. What do they all have in common? None of them lived in places that were desperate, that had ne necessity for invention. They all lived in the richest places on earth at the time. And they all lived in places with trading contact with the rest of the world. They all lived in places where there were, which were crossroads for ideas. So uh, Archimedes in ancient Greece, al Khwarizmi in Abbasid Arabia, Fibonacci in Renaissance Italy, George Stevenson in Victorian Britain, Thomas Edison in New Jersey, uh, and <laughs> Steve Jobs in California. It's these places where people migrate and meet other people, where ships come and go bringing ideas and things, where airlines nowadays bring ideas and things, and of course, above all, where the cables that connect our collective brain wire us up so that ideas flow from one person to another. So in the old days, if you had to get a gastroenterologist and a guided missile designer together, it might take months. Today, it takes seconds. And that surely means that the innovation rate uh, is going to accelerate, if anything. That's very like a picture of a brain, but it isn't. It's a picture of the internet. My point is that the internet is a brain. We are the nodes in the neural network. And the more we connect people, the more we will see innovation. And that's actually the only limiting factor on the supply of ideas for new ideas that can help us in the future. Go back to this one more time and ask yourself not just who made the mouse, but who knew how to make it? How many people in the world know how to make a computer mouse? Do you think it's five? Do you think it's 500? Do you think it's five million? Shall I take a show of hands? Go on. Who, wants, who thinks five people in the world know how to make a computer mouse? Who thinks 500? One or two? Five million? More of you? I think you're all wrong. <laughs> I think it's zero. There is no human being on the planet who knows how to make this thing. Because the man who runs the mouse company doesn't know, he just knows how to run a company. The man on the assembly line doesn't know because he doesn't know how to drill an oil well. If you wanted to make that from scratch, and there was a guy called Thomas Thwaites who set out a few years ago to make a, make a toaster from scratch. And after about two years with a lot of grants from the Arts Council or something, he'd ended up with something that could, you know, using vast amounts of electricity could just about sort of char bread. Um, and he was trying to imitate something that cost $3.99. Um, that's the point. We don't know how to make these things. The knowledge isn't stored in individual heads. It's stored in the cloud. It's beyond the capacity of individual. By the way, this is why I'm not interested in arguments about IQ, about whether one group is cleverer than another group. Individual IQ isn't what counts. Collective IQ is what counts. Put 100 clever people in a room and tell them not to talk to each other, then they'll achieve far less than if you put 100 stupid people in a room and tell them to talk to each other as much as possible. That's how the human uh, process works. OK, so I've given you some reasons why I think that life is pretty cheerful at the moment, and why that's because of innovation, and why innovation is an evolutionary process that comes about because of the exchange of ideas, and that you can't really stop it if you, in, unless you isolate people. But can it go on? Or am I like the man who falls out of a skyscraper and as he passes the second story he shouts, so far so good. <laughs> well, I think it can. And I'm going to give you a few, just a few reasons. This is far too big a topic to, to, to go into. Just a few reasons about why I think ecologically we actually can solve our problems quite well in the next hundred years. And my starting point is this quotation. We cannot absolutely prove that those are in error who say society has reached a turning point, that we have seen our best days. But so said all who came before us, and with just as much apparent reason. On what principle is it that with nothing but improvement behind us, we are to expect nothing but deterioration before us? That's not me saying that. 
That's Thomas Babington Macaulay in 1830. Already then he was fed up with the pessimists, saying things can't get better, they can only get worse. He was reviewing a book by Robert Southey, the poet, who was saying this industrial revolution stuff is all a very bad idea and we shouldn't do it. Um, and the point is that we've been saying this. all along. We've been saying our generation is at a turning point. For 400 years or so, it's about to get worse, and it never does. It keeps getting better. Indeed, many of the problems we face are getting easier to solve. I mean, the population was growing at 2% a year in the 1960s. It's growing at 1% a year now. It quadrupled in the 20th century. It's not even going to double in this century. It is going to go up from current 7 billion to about 10 billion uh, before it levels off. Um, but population growth rate is probably going to be zero at some time in the second half of this century. So in terms of the number of people we've got to cope with, it's the problems in many ways getting easier rather than harder. And of course it's getting easier because we're bringing ingenuity to make more from less. That's what we do with technology all the time. This isn't your subject, I know, but it's interesting to realise just how much more food you can make from less land if you apply modern techniques of fertilisers and pesticides and tractors and all these other things. This is US data. But if you take all the world's crops and you average the amount of food you get from, from all of them and work out what's happening, then you find that f compared with 50 years ago, we need 65% less land to produce the same amount of food. And Africa's hardly started down this road. African yields are still roughly what they were 50 years ago. So if we could bring modern agriculture to Africa, we could use even less land to produce the amount of food that we need. So I suspect we're actually going to be releasing land uh, from human habitation and human exploitation over the next 50 years. Energy. We thought energy was going to run out. Even five years ago when I was writing my book, everybody said gas is going to be the first <coughs> fossil fuel to run out. Nobody thinks that now because of shale gas, because of working out how to get gas out of the source rock where it, where it all originates, we now have rock bottom prices for gas in the United States and a huge glut and America is, has overtaken Russia as the biggest gas producer in the world. What about climate though? Are we heading for Armageddon? Well, we've certainly got warming. There's no question about it. Over the last third of a century, we've seen roughly a third of a degree of warming. That's an awful lot less though than the models were predicting. And indeed, there's been a levelling off of the warming in the recent years. So we, everything is, suggests that what we're getting is the full carbon dioxide effect, but none of the amplifying factors that you need to make this really dangerous. And even if it does warm, it doesn't necessarily mean that some of these bad things are going to happen. Here's an example from malaria. Malaria used to be all around the world, even in cold places uh, in the early part of the century. Today, it's now largely confined to Africa and a few other places in the tropics. And that's not because the weather got less congenial to mosquitoes. It's because we did something about it. We used drugs and we drained marshes and we used insecticides and we moved indoors and shut the windows. In fact, the most important thing we did, according to a very interesting study, is that we reduced our family sizes, that we reduced our household size. Once, once there were less than few people, four people per house, turns out that it's very hard for malaria to spread because the mosquito is mainly infecting people inside each house and there's a fairly low success rate and four people is just not enough for it to get the, 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 the parasite spreading. So we're bound to go on reducing malaria in the 21st century whether the climate gets more congenial to mosquitoes or not. The most fascinating one, I think, is that we're actually making the planet greener at the moment. There's been a roughly 14% increase in the amount of green vegetation on the planet. This has been measured by both the amount of carbon dioxide that's absorbed out of the air every year and by the satellites which pick up greenery and measure it. And a large part of this is because we're producing more carbon dioxide, which is a, a gas that plants need. So plants, so the Sahel region, for example, just south of the Sahara, has got a whole lot greener in the last 20 years. In other words, I don't think this century is going to be awful. I think it's going to be wonderful. Obviously, horrible things will happen, no doubt. Um, you know, I can't promise it's all going to be a bed of roses for every minute. Nonetheless, I think the possibilities for humankind are extraordinary, because in the end, the only limiting factor is the supply of ideas, and that, as I think you said in your conference title, is infinite. In going from the individual intelligence embodied in objects like this, 
to the collective intelligence embodied in an object like this, we transform our prospects. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.